Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to CSIS. I am uh, Andy Cutchins, director of the Russia and Eurasia program. I think the emphasis today we would put on Eurasia with this program. Uh, we're really delighted to be uh, co-hosting this event uh, with the Asian Development Bank to talk about the energy situation in Afghanistan and Pakistan. And a long time project and dream, the TAPI pipeline, uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. Um, this is, uh, of course, a pipeline with a long history, uh, nearly, nearly 20 years, uh, as I understand it. And in fact, one of the uh, pioneers who was involved in a, an earlier iteration of the project, uh, Carlos Buglaroni, the CEO of Britis, is a, he actually has his name up on one of the, the rooms upstairs as a major supporter of CSIS and a, and a board member. And uh, Carlos has regaled me of stories of his travels in Afghanistan back in the 1990s, uh, meeting with various regional leaders uh, to talk about this project. Um, and of course, we all know that uh, the project didn't come off at that time and was sitting on the shelf, I think, for a number of years. Uh, but it has reemerged uh, in the last six, seven, eight years. Where would you put the date at, gentlemen? Take your pick. Take your pick. Um, and uh, and particularly uh, thinking about it is its role uh, in stabilizing Afghanistan. Um, and uh, here at CSIS, uh, uh, myself and several others, and uh, along with Fred Starr at uh, Sice Catchy, um, kind of across the street, uh, we got very in involved in this and thinking about an economic, a regional economic development strategy for Afghanistan. Um, as a, uh, a Sovietologist myself, or I cut my teeth as a Sovietologist, in the 1980s I knew a lot about the Soviet-Afghan war, but I didn't really get very involved in looking at closely um, our more recent uh, military uh, adventure in Afghanistan uh, post 9-11. Uh, until about the fall of 2009, when the debate was kind of raging in, uh, in Washington about Afghan strategy. And we had just uh, completed, or were in the midst of completing, uh, several reports tied to the development of the Northern Distribution Network uh, to support our troops in Afghanistan, which led us to start thinking about a regional economic strategy for Afghanistan and to talk about it in terms of a, of a modern Silk Road. But what was so striking to me in those days about the debate, I felt the debate was so narrow. We seemed to be only talking about military security issues. And even in that context, it was just, you know, was it counterterrorism or counterinsurgency? And how much, you know, how, how much should the troop presence be increased? How long should it be there for, et cetera, et cetera? And it was really striking to me that it seemed that the, the economic side of the, uh, of the equation was under attended to. Um, and, you know, whatever success uh, was achieved on the military side, you know, if there wasn't sustainable economic development for Afghanistan, it just seemed clear that the likelihood of that success sticking was not going to be tremendously high. And uh, so, of course, the TAPI pipeline was one of the key projects that uh, we were very enthusiastic about and uh, encouraged in a report that we published in uh, June of 2010, it was modestly titled A Modern Silk Road Strategy, The Key to Success in Afghanistan. Um, and of course, it was, uh, the project has been adopted by the Obama administration as a central piece of uh, their new Silk Road vision uh, for the region and has been assiduously pushing for the development of it. But it's really the Asian Development Bank that has been um, most active in the region uh, for years uh, through the, uh, through CARIC and other activities, the Central Asia Regional Economic uh, Council. Cooperation. Cooperation, excuse me. I've always found that acronym a little bit funny. There's not a something on the end that's a noun, but, or more like a different kind of noun. But, uh, uh, <clears throat> So it's terrific, terrific today that we have three people here to uh, discuss 
the, uh, the energy situation in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, the role that the TAPI pipeline could play, uh, and then a very informed audience to uh, discuss uh, and about various aspects of commercial viability, technical uh, issues, um, the role of the security situation, political, et cetera, et cetera. I would just conclude the introductory remarks before turning the floor over to, uh, to Craig and introducing our other panelists uh, that the, the Baku Tbilisi Chehan pipeline uh, is and was described as a very, very strategic pipeline. But when I think about TAPI, that is, maybe it is the strategic pipeline of the century, potentially. If you think about a, as a spur or a catalyst to help in the development of the very rich um, gas resources in Turkmenistan, if you think about the key role that it could play or that if it's, if coming to reality it would represent for the stabilization of Afghanistan, um, and then the role that it could play in furthering reconciliation between not just uh, Pakistan and India, but uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan, boy, that would be a big, big, big win, win, win across the board. So let me uh, introduce our, uh, our panelists uh, this morning. We'll, we're going to have a slight change in the order. We're going to lead with uh, uh, Craig Stephenson, who is the uh, ADB's resident representative here in Washington. And he's been uh, here in the uh, Washington office since May of 2013. He has led the, uh, the, uh, the North American Regional Office, NARO, in its efforts to strengthen collaboration between the ADB and leading policymakers, academic, public, private sector partners, think tanks, capacity building institutions, and multilateral and bilateral development partners, and to raise public awareness of the ADB in the U.S. and Canada. I guess this, our uh, meeting this morning this is part of that, right? Uh, he, has, uh, he was assigned as country director to the ADB's Thailand resident mission from 2010 to 2013. Uh, but before that, uh, he was uh, the team leader in Afghanistan from 2001 to 2004, and again from 2008 to 2010. And he is also assigned as the head of Central Asia uh, Regional Economic Cooperation Unit, CARIC, uh, based in Almaty, in Kazakhstan from 2005 to 2007. So a lot of experience uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, after Craig, we will be turning to Aruna Strom, um, who is the director of the Energy Division in the Central and West Asia Department of the Asian Development Bank, overseeing a range of ADB's leading lending and non-lending operations in the region, covering Afghanistan, uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Kazakhstan, uh, the Kyrgyz Republic, Pakistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. Uh, and he leads energy sector policy dialogues with these nations and focuses our, on regional cooperation in the energy sector under the Central Asia, uh, under CARIC. Uh, and maybe this is an appropriate time to note that uh, tomorrow morning we're going to be gathering again with uh, several of the same uh, uh, characters and taking uh, ruthless advantage of Runa's presence here in the Washington uh, to talk about the two-tap uh, interconnection concept and the CASA 1000 project here, same time, same place, tomorrow, okay? Uh, and finally, last and hardly not hardly least, uh, is Jim Liston, who is the Principal Energy Specialist in the Energy Division for Central and West Asia Development. And Jim is an engineer with over 30 years of public and private sector industry experience in developing and developed countries worldwide. He joined the Asian the ADB in 2007, where he's worked in the Central Asia and West Asia Department on power sector investment and technical assistance projects. And Jim has developed and implemented domestic and regional projects in all Central Asian countries and in Afghanistan, Pakistan. So for further information on the uh, biographies of our distinguished uh, speakers, uh, please consult the uh, material we've given you. And let me turn the floor over now to Craig. And uh, Craig, thanks again for uh, uh, having the, uh, the idea to do this uh, meeting this morning, as well as the meeting tomorrow morning. Thanks. Thank you, Andy. And uh, of course, thank you very much to CSIS for hosting this event today. 
Um, Rune, Jim, and I were having a beer last night, and Jim um, told me that I should open up by talking about ADB. And I'm kind of reluctant to do that because you can check our website, adb.org, and get all the information you want. And I got home last night and told my three-year-old daughter, Ziggy, that I was going to see a bunch of people this morning, and what should I tell them? And with a big smile on her face, she said, tell them I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I could tell you that, you know, as Jim suggested, that, that, that ADB is an intergovernmental organization headquartered in Manila, established in 1966. Uh, the United States and Japan are the two largest shareholders in ADB uh, that we uh, provide loans, grants, uh, technical assistance, policy dialogue, and equity uh, to um, uh, our developing member countries. But instead, I think uh, the message I want to get across this morning is that you should just think of us as the love bank. <laughs> the love bank. The love bank. And, uh, at the risk of getting fired by my management, I better get, get serious here. Uh, I spent nine years of my life living and working in Central Asia and Afghanistan, and uh, I think since the first day I set foot in, in Kabul, I, I heard about the TAPI project, and it seemed like such a great idea, and I was never quite clear why it hadn't gotten started a long time ago. That was 2001. Um, I was also struck by virtue of my having lived in Almaty for a, a while, why certain countries uh, were so energy rich, they had so many resources, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan come to mind, Iran, but other countries in the sub-region, um, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Pakistan uh, could be so deprived. And it just seemed to me that the ADB as a regional development bank uh, with some comparative advantage in energy, uh, we've done um, transmission and distribution projects in pretty much every country where we have operations, uh, hadn't done more. And fast forward 13 years, uh, things have changed a lot. They've changed in Afghanistan. We've got an entirely uh, new set of relationships in Central Asia that we've been uh, taking care of. And uh, I think we're fortunate today to have with us um, two people who, who I've known in for a long time, who, who I don't hesitate to say are two of ADB's best and brightest. Uh, I've been in meetings with them this week, and when it comes to Afghanistan and Pakistan and the sub-region and TAPI and TUTAP, which uh, the Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan um, initiative, or CASA 1000, I don't think we could have you know, two better speakers representing ADB here with us today. Um, I won't introduce them formally because their information is here in your paperwork. But uh, the last thing I want to say is that ADB has an office in Washington. We're located at 917th Street, just down the street uh, on Farragut Square. Uh, we have lots of publications around. You're welcome to visit our office and poke through them. If there's anything that I can do for you, please don't hesitate to let me know. I'll put you in touch with people in ADB who may have the answers, because I probably won't. Uh, aside from that, again, thank you, Andy, for getting us over here today and uh, uh, look forward to the discussion that follows. Let me turn now to Jim Liston, who's going to kick off. Thanks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Andrew and Craig, for those introductions and kind words. Um, as I was introduced as a power engineer, you might uh, expect that some of my presentation might dwell on some technical aspects of the Afghan uh, power system or energy system. So I hope you find that somewhat interesting. I'll speak for maybe about 20 minutes on three topics. I'll just give an introduction <clears throat> on Afghanistan. I'll uh, present the summary findings of a master plan that has been conducted 
And then I'll go through some regional initiatives. And during the introduction from Andrew, he spoke at length on uh, TUTAP, of course, a very important initiative. But I'd like to say that there are other uh, equally interesting regional initiatives to do with electricity interconnection. And I'd like to just hit on a couple of those points. So some overview, <clears throat> uh, in case you're not aware fully. Um, so it's 600,000 square kilometers. That's about the size of Texas. Population 30 million, ranks at 40th in the world. So it's a significant country. Uh, it's gross, gross national income, $680. Not sure really what that exactly means. If you do PPP, it's obviously a higher figure. In any case, it's probably in about the bottom 10% of the world in terms of wealth. And it's 36% of the population is living below the um, poverty line. So we're talking about a poor country. It's mineral rich, copper, iron, bauxite, gems. There's great potential. This is a country that can really grow. But today, these minerals have not been exploited. Energy sources, it's rich in coal and gas. And of course, hydro, 20,000 uh, gigawatts of hydro potential is estimated. And of course, solar and wind. But again, these energy resources have yet to be exploited. And it's, apart from its re resources, its location gives it a particularly strategic location or strategic advantage in that it, it allows itself to be the transit country, the Silk Road between Central Asia, energy-rich Central Asia, and power-poor Afghanistan and Pakistan. And I'll speak about that in a moment. Donor support um, in the early 2000s, the, uh, the, the donors returned to, to Afghanistan. The, after 30 years of war, the infrastructure was in a a very poor shape. The donors focused initially on emergency generation, is diesel power plants mainly. But the main supply to Afghanistan was focused on imports. That rather complicated diagram there uh, uh, shows the what's called the Northeast Power System, referred to as NEPS, and that shows the connection with Turkmenistan. Uh, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan, and these three import points bring power to Kabul, and whereas some years ago you had one hour per day of electricity in Kabul, today you have 24 hours of electricity. It's quite a success. Um, we have also, we the donors, have also focused on sector restructuring. So there is now a, a corporate uh, power utility, DABS, the Afghan Brezhna Sharkat. It's a corporate, uh, corporate entity which is operating successfully. And we have focused on capacity building. The donors uh, cover uh, USAID, a significant uh, donor, a World Bank, Islamic Development Bank. Uh, KFW from, from Germany, Government of India, and of course, Asian Development Bank. In the energy sector, ADB is the, is the largest donor. Since we uh, processed our first project in 2003, uh, we have invested almost $1 billion in energy alone, representing approximately $100 million per year. That's our, our uh, investment. <clears throat> now, what has all this done? And we all hear a lot of negative um, publicity uh, about the situation in, in Afghanistan. And at high levels, you can talk about generation and imports and whatever. But to me, the important thing is how many people get electricity? What is your electrification rate? What are you getting supplied? Now, when we started, it was around 7% so 7 of the population 
uh, had access to, to electricity. And today, 20, 2013, March 2014, you have over 30%. That's one million, over one million customers and about seven or eight population per customer. That's, that's a significant achievement. I think we can be proud of what has been done. You can see the graph there showing the, um, the increase and any visitor to Afghanistan will notice this, will, will see this. That's the history. Uh, the challenge is to keep this up. So ADB uh, sponsored a, a technical assistance power sector master plan. The website is um, shown on this slide there. And for those of you with the energy to go through the 1,000 plus pages, that's where you'll get it all. I'll try to summarize it into this slide here. And today, you have a, a multi-island system. Actually, you don't have a, um, an Afghan power system. You don't have an integrated grid. In fact, you have up to 11 separate electrical islands. They're fed from different countries, Iran, Uzbekistan, to Turkmenistan, Tajikistan. And there are islands fed from its own generation. And such an approach of 11 islands, <clears throat> of course, has not been done anywhere else in the world, and that's for good reason. Every country in the, since electricity was invented has enjoyed the benefits of economies of scale, build big power plants, transmit the energy is the cheapest way, for now anyway. And Afghanistan has not enjoyed this disadvantage. It's got small, high-cost generation, where it has generation. Um, its peak load is 850 megawatts, which is very small, 3,500 gigawatt hours, with 70% of its electricity imported. That's the situation today. Now, by 2032, the, um, the, the master plan recommends the construction of an integrated grid for all the advantages I just mentioned. Uh, it's, a, it's not quite a circle because the demand does not uh, justify a circle today. It will be a, a circle. It's a U-shaped grid, as you can see there. And the peak demand and energy consumption will increase fivefold over 20, 20 years. This to bring its energy consumption up to uh, rates consistent with the region of uh, India and Pakistan. So these are not overly ambitious targets. And the energy supply will continue in the short term to be met from imports, but the plan identifies increasing domestic generation. Now, today, uh, 2011, you, there is some uh, domestic production. It's, it's a hydro-based country. Uh, it's gigawatt hours over the last 10 years uh, has met from its domestic market has been about 1,000, mainly met from hydro. And that's seasonal, that's summer only. So that's a, that's a constraint. And thermal, which has been uh, developed by the donors since the early 2000s is largely diesel. And this is expensive, maybe 40, 50 cents per, per, per kilowatt hour. So this is not really a long-term solution. And today you've got, as I said, 70% fed from imports. And of that 70%, the majority is coming from Turkmenistan and Iran with uh, Turkmenistan coming in third, and Tajikistan fourth, but these latter two are very important for, for the future. This is a growing, a growing source of, of supply. By 2032, new thermal plants. Obviously, its hydro uh, supply is, uh, is good, but it's seasonal. 
So new thermal plants are required. Shubigan gas fired, tried to exploit the benefits of the existing gas. INAC coal plant, a private sector um, uh, uh, coal plant, and Kunar, a big uh, hydro development. So it's forecast that imports will drop to about 30% of, of total. And the major increase in imports, in fact, are forecast to come from Turkmenistan. Uzbekistan has, has uh, constraints, uh, its own constraints, and Tajikistan is a hydro-rich country. Again, it's summer supply only, the big source of dispatchable supply for Afghanistan is to come from Turkmenistan, which is the regional project, part of the regional project, which complements uh, TAPI, uh, which I'll speak about in a moment. And by 2032, electrification rate should reach 86% from the current 30%. So right now, what uh, Rune, what ADB, what I, what we're working on in, in partnership with our, with our donors, USAID, World Bank, we're focusing to continue the increase on the imports, particularly Turkmenistan, and to develop the gas, coal, and hydro plants, and to strengthen the domestic grid, which includes transmission to allow the imports, and of course, uh, distribution to continue the electrification rate. Now, there's a particular uh, unusual feature about the Afghan uh, system and its energy planning. It's, it's quite unique in the world. And there's a reason, of course, why it has 11 separate islands. And that's because with its imports coming from uh, four countries, it's not a simple matter of bringing these imports together and supplying a, a common load because these four countries are not themselves connected. Whereas Turkmenistan and Iran are now connected, Uzbekistan and Tajikistan are not, are, a, there is no electrical connection today between those two countries. So when these supplies come to Afghanistan to meet, to supply an integrated grid requires a special solution. And the solution that has been proposed by the Afghan Power Sector Master Plan is to locate a common hub in the north of the country which will enable a conversion from AC to DC to AC. For the non-technical people, you know, this is, a, this is a standard approach to connect asynchronous systems. So for example, here in America, uh, in fact, as I understand it, you do not have a, a single um, integrated system. You have three systems, uh, Eastern Interconnect, Western Interconnect, and Texas. But you too are building the Tres Amigos um, HVDC power plant to allow trade between these uh, separately connected systems. And there are many examples, Japan, Georgia exporting to, uh, to Turkey, where such technology is being used. So it's proposed to build a HVDC project. And in fact, this is part of the ADB uh, current project that we are hoping to bring to our board this year, which would be um, focused initially on increasing the interconnection with Turkmenistan using this HVDC technology. Now, a particular benefit or an advantage, a spin-off of this approach. So the master plan was designed to meet the Afghan needs, make an integrated grid, bring the imports, build your generation, reduce your reliance on, on imports, and this is excellent. But then it was noted that for quite a modest increase in the investment in the grid, that in fact uh, the connection from Afghanistan to Pakistan would allow these three countries and countries in order, such as Kyrgyz Republic and Kazakhstan to wheel power through Afghanistan 
while meeting the Afghan needs and surplus power over their needs could be supplied to power poor Pakistan. The reference was made to the acronym TUTAP, and of course, every good project needs an acronym, and this project is no exception. And so we call it, from the, 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 the directly connected countries concerned, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, TUTAP, that we link Central Asia to Afghanistan, meet the Afghan needs, and that they can take advantage of their strategic location and wheel power through to Pakistan. <clears throat> so that's a summary there. Turkmenistan, um, fourth largest gas reserves in the world. Tajikistan, uh, enormous hydro resources. Uh, today, it is spilling its, um, its summer energy. It doesn't have a market. Uzbekistan, gas and coal, and Kyrgyz, again, hydro. These four countries wish to the opportunity, the business opportunity, to export to power poor Asia. This can go through Afghanistan and onto Pakistan. And so this is part of the overriding concept of CASRM yet more acronyms, if you forgive me. Central Asia, South Asia, Regional Electricity Market. This is an initiative that has been running for some years now, and there are two projects under implementation, implementation right now. And one I've mentioned is TUTAP, which is uh, being sponsored by ADB. And again, this week, we are speaking to our donor partners to ensure the ongoing development of this project, which is happening today, and CASA 1000, which is a World Bank-sponsored initiative. And again, this has recently been approved by the World Bank Board, and I'll just show you what these two projects are. But again, this shows the opportunity for Afghanistan to benefit from its strategic location. So there you've got your, your three countries. So the, the Tajikistan to Afghanistan, that line exists. It's there today. It's operational right now. Uzbekistan to Afghanistan, that exists. It's today supplying power to, to Kabul. Turkmenistan to Afghanistan, that project is financed by ADB. The Turkmen authorities have constructed the line to their border. It's oper well, it's not operational. It's constructed today. And under ADB financing, that line will continue into Afghanistan. And as I mentioned, we propose to build a HVDC station to allow the full interconnection of Turkmenistan. They're all meeting at this hub point that I mentioned in the north. It's called Puli Khomri. And then Puli Khomri to Kabul, that's a project that's under implementation today. In fact, TUTAP, by 2018, these three countries supplying Afghanistan will be supplying the Afghan demand, and for a modest, for a small incremental increase, a connection from Kabul to Pakistan, which is 400 kilometers, maybe 200 million, can wheel power through from Central Asia to, to Pakistan. So it's not only TAPI, there is also TUTAP. CASA 1000 is the um, World Bank-sponsored uh, initiative. It's more regional in nature. It's focused on taking the hydro surplus from Kyrgyz Republic and Tajikistan and bringing that summer surplus power to Pakistan. Um, it will it, uh, bring some supply to uh, Afghanistan. The primary purpose of CASA 1000 is to link the hydro-rich Kyrgyz and Tajik regions to power poor Pakistan. That project is approved by World Bank Board and is now in the early stages of implementation. So there you've got the two projects. And of course, uh, we are coordinating with our partners, with our donor partners. Uh, there's a range of donor partners involved in, the, in this initiative. So ensuring the, the timely coordination and synchronism of the TAPI and CASA initiative, 
And just to kind of put it into a schematic sense, there is the um, there are the lines going from Uzbek Kyrgyz to Polycomri existing. Turkmenistan to Polycomri, they can be operational by 2018. The line from Polycomri down to Kabul also would be operational by 2018. That's 500 kV double circuit line. This is a significant investment. And then, of course, the the uh, Castle 1000, which will match, which will tie in there. And this will bring, this will construct a, a strong linkage between Central Asia supplying Afghanistan and Pakistan and allowing the Central Asian countries to take advantage of their energy resources to meet the energy uh, deficient power poor Afghanistan and Pakistan. I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Jim. Uh, let's turn right now to, uh, to Runa. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is indeed a pleasure to um, visit Washington, D.C. Uh, it's been a, quite a few years since uh, we in the Energy Division visited last time. And uh, the second part of this presentation will focus on Pakistan. Uh, Pakistan is, uh, is a key country in our region, and uh, it is also probably one of the more challenging countries in our region. A little bit of background just to get us into the, to the picture of things. The, the last five year GDP average growth rate is about 3%. Foreign currencies reserves are down to 3 billion, which is about a month of imports. We're looking at the um, uh, domestic debt. One third of this increase is caused by the power sector. That means that the power crisis in Pakistan is not only a sector crisis, it is a national crisis. Today, 5,000 megawatts short, and this is the summer months in Pakistan, so we are actually looking at somewhere around 7,000 megawatts. The um, result for the people is in the cities, about 10 to 12 hours of load shedding, and out in the rural areas, we're looking about 20 hours of load shedding. You can imagine what will happen to the politicians in Washington DC if these figures existed here. The um, GDP impact of this shortage is a reduction of 2% of GDP growth. What is interesting here is that Pakistan needs today, due to its demographics, a 7% increase in its GDP just to absorb the new entrance into the labor market. Now, this is kind of a cold, hard facts. What does it mean that a number of young people don't get employment? What are the alternatives? Radicalism is the alternative that puts food on the table. So think through this in that perspective of what do people do if they don't get jobs? What are the alternatives? The fiscal subsidies uh, is about $4.8 billion in 2013. Uh, imagine how many schools, hospitals, health care services, social network that could be developed with this kind of money. The payment arrears, as they are today, or given in the presentation, um, it is a substantial amount of money. And when we add to this that one third of the population does not have access to electricity, we all understand why there is a limited economic growth in the country. Now, what do we do about this? Um, it doesn't take too much intelligence to actually figure out the facts. The challenge that is ahead of the government of Pakistan, the people of Pakistan, and us as their development partners is 
what do we do about this? How can we fix this? It, there has been a concerted effort by the donor community, uh, most prominently put through uh, a, uh, I would call it a, a close-knit group, the Friends of Democratic Pakistan, uh, and we focused on three areas. The Asian Development Bank was the co-chair together with the government of Pakistan, and these three areas was we need to get the costing of the product, the service delivery, so that it doesn't impact the national budget. That means that we need to manage the tariffs. We need to look at the technical performance, the management performance. And then we've got to look at the accountabilities and transparencies, in other words, governance of the sector. So these three pillars has been the basis for looking at and enhancing the energy security and reliability in Pakistan. Pakistan has a very interesting tariff system. There is a regulator, uh, NEPRA. NEPRA does a full cost recovery tariff called a determined tariff. Unfortunately, the government says, uh, no, our people cannot be charged this amount that NEPRA determines. So then there is a notified tariff that is below the um, determined tariff. That means that there is a subsidy requirement and at the moment, that subsidy requirement is about four rupees per kilowatt hour. And that means that the government of Pakistan must find the cash to pay for that subsidy. It also means that every kilowatt hour produced is a deficit kilowatt hour. So the more electricity that is being produced, the more money the government has to pay. This is a very vicious circle who has led, which has led to what is the, the, the term in, used in Pakistan is the circular debt problem. The uh, subsidies, if we measure them against the GDP, is now about 2%. 1.75% was a few months ago. And the situation has worsened, is about 2% of GDP. And again, we can think about alternative ways of spending the money. In terms of performance, when a sector doesn't get the cash it requires, maintenance is low, augmentation it doesn't take place, and new investments does not take place at the required rate. That means that the losses are relatively high. Here we have put up, in terms of the transmission and distribution, about 23%. We should have been here, if there is an international compare comparative figures, we should be around 10 to 12 percent. So Pakistan has double of the losses uh, compared to the international standards. We also look at the fuel mix in Pakistan. 35 percent of the generation comes from fuel oil. Fuel oil is expensive. So for the 35 percent of the fuel mix actually requires 75 percent of the money. This is not a good equation. It needs to change. Uh, there's no concept of energy conservation. We spend what we can get when we get it, and if we don't have any, we try to find other things to do. It's the attitude that is prevalent. Accountability and transparency. Um, there is little monitoring and enforcement of the licenses given by the regulator. There, uh, doesn't seem to be many people being held accountable for mismanagement and poor decision making in the, in the sector. And the sector information is challenging to interpret as there are political influences in what is being presented and how it is being presented. So the reliability of data is, is difficult to rely on in terms of investment decisions and also management and operational aspects. Energy sector for reforms in Pakistan has been going on for a long time. Started in 1992, there was a set of new laws coming out in 1998. Um, the legal framework is very good. The regulatory framework is very good. The implementation, well, the grade would be an F in terms of what Pakistan has been able to do so far. The uh, National power targets, policies, all of that is it, it, the framework is uh, is very there's nothing there's nothing wrong with it, but again the implementation is what is lacking. It is 
being influenced by too many interest groups rather than the economic interests of the country. Right now, Pakistan is once again under an IMF program. This is, if I remember correctly, the ninth or tenth program they have with the IMF. They have only completed one program so far. So that means there is a bit of a challenge for the government to stay with the requirements and targets that they have agreed with IMF. Now, here we have a problem tree, and I'm not going to go through all the colors and all the boxes and all the, the interlinkages. It only shows that the main box is the third one from the top, which says energy shortage. And there is a, to illustrate a, a number of uh, analysis and discussions and uh, due diligence work by a lot of donors and uh, good agencies that have come up with this and have been able to look at cause and effect, look at what needs to be tackled, and the areas that are colored here are what the Asian Development Bank is part of tackling. What are we implementing now? Um, one of the challenges uh, for a, an educated audience like yourself is how can we convey the knowledge and the information of what we are focusing on. Um, we thought the best way to do so was to tell you about the projects we do and why we do these projects. Uh, what we have here is that we have focused on the renewable energy. Uh, that means in Pakistan, hydro. Hydro is an undervalued asset. The uh, plants, and again, uh, the uh, Water and Power Development Authority in Pakistan has a very good hydro planning department. They have plans for about 55,000 megawatts. Today, 6,500 megawatts are being utilized. What does it take in terms of investments to help? Uh, so we are focusing on the renewable energy. We are looking at the transmission sector. One thing is to get sufficient generation, but we need to evacuate the power and we need to get it down to the distribution companies and then the customers. So we're focusing on transmission, distribution, uh, energy efficiency. We have had what we call a CFL uh, bulb project for $60 million. We have been able to save 1,000 megawatts in terms of the shortage. That's the cheapest way of building a power plant, is actually to look at alternative energy efficiency uh, operations, and Pakistan has quite a bit to uh, benefit from in terms of energy efficiency. We are looking at low cost generation. Um, this is a topic that excites the US government quite a bit. The Jamshoro power generation project is a 1200 megawatt coal fired power station. If you're looking at energy for all, and if you're going to counter the, uh, the cost of the import of the oil, we need to look at a generation source that is much, much cheaper. And the, on the generation plan in Pakistan, coal fired is the lowest uh, fuel, lowest cost fuel, and hence ADB is involved in this project. What are we doing going forward? We're focusing on a few uh, programmatic issues. The, the energy sector reform program for those of you who have followed this in Pakistan, that means that we are a subset of the IMF program. We are working with the World Bank and our Japanese colleagues, JICA. Uh, the three of us have uh, negotiated with the government of Pakistan a uh, policy reform and uh, uh, found a set of requirements, a set of tasks that needs to be completed before funds are being provided to the government. And we are doing this in a, a programmatic approach. That means that the overall program is $1.2 billion. And then we have five sub-programs, one per year. We already did the first one, which was $400 million. And now we have a set of four sub-programs, which will come on an annual basis. And there are preset targets and uh, tasks that has, has to be com uh, uh, completed before funds are being changed. The, um, other aspects here is we're looking at uh, tran more transmission work, more distribution work, and facilitating a system that will be able to, uh, to capture the additional generation that is now under 
construction in several places in Pakistan. Looking at the, the reform program, as I said, we are trying to manage the tariffs and the subsidies. We are trying to target tasks that are required to inform the operational performance. And we are looking at the transparency of uh, amount produced, amount purchased by the distribution companies, and also transparency about the load shedding management operations of the government. All of this is what we want to have on the internet for public uh, display and create a debate about optimal utilization of the power available. Giving you a, uh, a little detour. About a year ago, Pakistan went through an election process. It is very easy to say that the industry will not get any power, but the domestic sector will get power. Because where is the vote base? The vote base is the domestic people. So the government makes decisions based on political wishes and concerns rather than the economic one for the country. And we need to change this into what is best for the economy? How does the individual actually get cash in their pockets to spend on food and necessities for the families? And also, what gives economic growth for the government itself? If you do load shedding into the industry, that means that the tax income goes down. So it's a direct impact of how you manage the load shedding on the revenue side of the government budget. These aspects need to be more streamlined to optimize the benefits for the country and not for individual political parties. Uh, Jamshoro, I talked about uh, looking at cheaper uh, electricity generation. We are now also looking at uh, some hydro facilities and to help Pakistan utilize the, um, the comparative advantage it has from the high mountains in the north and the water coming down through the Indus system. Uh, indeed, it's a, it's a fascinating system that needs to be utilized much more than what it is today. Uh, transmission, distribution, I'll just skip through this because that we have already talked about it. And energy efficiency is then looking at uh, not wasting the energy that is being produced, it is precious, and be able to use it and optimize the, uh, the aspects. What I want to do now is that I want to go over to, I think I need uh, help again to, to get the other presentation up. Oh, here he is. Technology is great when you know how to use it. Short break in the action. Uh, while, while we get in the next uh, presentation up on the board, uh, I want to jump a little bit in the sense of uh, what we uh, focus on in our division. Jim went through Pakistan, uh, no, Afghanistan, and also TUTAP, and we have a, um, a, another large uh, initiative that we are part of, and Andrew mentioned this in the beginning, and uh, I, I do understand there is a certain amount of uh, fatigue talking about TAPI and the real, the realization of this absolutely fantastic project. Uh, let's go through some facts of TAPI first, and uh, we'll leave the, the challenges to um, the uh, a little bit later. It starts in Galkanish, which is a gas field in the southern part of Turkmenistan. It goes there to the border of Afghanistan, through the southern part of Afghanistan, into Baluchistan, over to India, uh, through the Multan area, and you end up in Fasilika in India. That is TAPI. Why TAPI? Why is this so interesting? First of all, we have a fantastic seller, Turkmenistan, sixth largest proven gas reserves in the world. It is the 16th ranked natural gas producer. These are 2011 figures. And this is basically a landlocked country. And it has a gas sales arrangement with Russia in the north and with China in the east, and there is more gas 
And obviously the comparative advantage of Turkmenistan is the gas resource and a southern sales route will allow Turkmenistan to have diversity in its sales options and then not be in a monopoly situation uh, of the purchasers that is currently in existence. Now, what is on the other side of the equation? The three buyers. <coughs> Excuse me. And the three buyers, Afghanistan has a relatively low requirement. It's basically a transition country. Uh, Pakistan is starving for energy, as you just saw. 5,000 megawatt shortage, not enough gas to run the, the plants that are already in existence. And it can take whatever volume that is available for sale. In, so we have Pakistan that is starving and India that is in shortage. So India is looking at its, uh, its uh, fuel mix as well and is very interested in the gas. And you see the volumes here in terms of the demand from both Pakistan and India. And basically we have three buyers that are very keen to buy. So far the equation looks very good. Now, what about TAPI, the project itself? TAPI starts at the border of, between Turkmenistan and Afghanistan. The government of Turkmenistan will supply the gas at the border. The TAPI pipeline project will pick it up at the border of Afghanistan and go to the border between Pakistan and India. Gale in India will pick up the gas on the, at the Indian border. When we talk about TAPI, it's a little bit about before Christ and after Christ kind of uh, uh, timelines here. Before the December 2010, we don't count. Uh, my own personal experience with TAPI was that I met as a very young ADB officer in 1996, Conoco, that was, uh, no, uh, not Conoco, it was Unical. Unical, uh, who came and visited Manila and talking about this fantastic project. And it has gone through a number of reiterations from then. But the real thing happened in 2010. It was a, a new spring of TAPI. The four countries was able to um, get excited about the project and get serious about the project. ADB's role has been as the secretariat of TAPI. That means that we are trying to be the glue between these four countries to work on not only the commercial arrangements, but the relationship between these four countries. is an absolutely fascinating and challenging task, and we will argue that up to uh, now, we have done a very decent job of it. And uh, it is not easy, and a lot of other interest groups don't understand that we only have one thing and one thing only to offer to these four countries, and that is our credibility and neutrality. They got to trust us. If there is anything in terms of the four countries where we will lose, that is if we lose our credibility. We will guard that credibility like a fort, and we will make sure that our neutrality in the process is being protected. That is not always popular by a number of other institutions and nations, but it's the only way that we can help these four, four countries realize the project. Looking at the phases, the project has five phases. As I said, the um, gas pipeline framework agreement was signed in December 2010, and this was with the four heads of states, plus our own president in the Asian Development Bank who witnessed the process. Uh, since then, we will argue that the process has moved forward quite rapidly. And this is definitely contradictory to popular belief. But to be able to take four countries through a high security concerned area and continue the process getting to the heads of agreement in April 2011, get to the gas sales and purchase agreements concluded in May 2012. And now the transaction advisor engagement took place in November 2013. So where it says September 2012 on the uh, slide, 
on the yellow phase three, that is not all concluded. That means that the Asian Development Bank has a second task, and that is to be the transaction advisor to the four countries on this very fascinating project. Jim and myself come from the Central and West Asia Energy Division. We are the secretariat. There is another unit that is the transaction advisory. And this is where we have a bit of a Chinese wall inside ADB because they are doing the commercial transaction advisory for the TAPI Limited company, whereas we would finance any of the four countries that would request financial support to participate in the project. So there's a distinction there in terms of our roles. Moving on, looking a little bit at the framework so you understand a little bit better what the TAPI is all about. It is the four countries. We have the intergovernment agreement, the gas pipeline framework agreement between these four countries. The four countries are rep represented by their Minister of Petroleum, uh, and we then move on to the commercial aspects of TAPI, and that is the four gas companies. You have uh, Turkmen Gas, you have the Afghanistan Gas Company, you have ISGS from Pakistan, and Gale of India. They have their own legal contracts, and it all ends up in the TAPI Consortium, which is TAPI Limited, which is the pipeline company. And then, of course, you have the, the, the standard contractual agreements, and the red item in the middle of the TAPI Consortium is the consortium leader, which is not yet selected. So this is still a selection process to take place. And here, just putting up the host country agreements, the pipeline system rule book, meaning the network codes, and looking at the operational agreements and the transportation agreements. I'll take you back again so you can see that. So there is a set of, of national interest, is a corporate interest, and you have TAPI Limited in the, in the middle. Uh, this is, uh, we have tried to keep it as simplified as possible and make sure that the legal agreements also are as simple and effective as possible. Looking at the TAPI consortium development, and there is a number of things that the state, the each national government has agreed to under the uh, gas uh, pipeline framework agreement. We then have the host country agreements where it spells out very clearly what the governments agreed to. And we then get into the business of, of running the pipeline. What is next? We are now working and the operations agreements are basically concluded. The transit fee agreements uh, are finished, negotiated. Um, we are now looking at the third bullet, establishing the TAPI pipeline consortium, and we are uh, in the process of working with the four gas companies to find the consortium leader. We have had one round of, um, well, we have had one road show where we went to Singapore, New York, London, and Ashgabat, uh, and presented the preliminary project to uh, international oil companies, pipeline companies, fi financial institutions, and sought their help in structuring, well, we explained the project, number one. Number two, we sought their assistance and uh, picking basically their brains on how we can structure the project in, uh, in the optimum matter. Parallel to this, the transaction advisory team are, are now updating feasibility studies and the information memorandum and there is also uh, discussions of, of where to incorporate TAPI Limited, of course, uh, looking at issues such as taxes, um, uh, arbitration, um, jurisdictions, et cetera, et cetera. The challenges, just to take some of the questions that you will have. Security in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, pipelines, both oil and gas pipelines have been put through some of the more risky parts of the world. It's nothing new. Uh, here we have uh, the Afghanistan government saying that they will look after the security of the pipeline on Afghan soil, and there will be an additional security cost, which will be part of the host country agreement. In Pakistan, uh, Pakistan has probably the best repairing skills of bombed 
gas pipelines in the world. <laughs> and this comes through experience. When I, today, when a gas pipeline of Suez Southern Gas get blown up in Baluchistan, it takes them less than 24 hours to get the bag gas back flowing. Absolutely fantastic. Uh, they are the, the peak competence in the world of repairing uh, bombed or blasted gas pipelines. At the same time in Pakistan, there is a number of depleted fields that can be used for storage. And what we have done as a part of our secretarial tasks is to look at the feasibility of pumping gas down back into the depleted fields, keep it as storage. So if something happens between the Turkmen-Afghanistan border and uh, close to the border between Pakistan and India, then there is a, a, an inventory of gas that can be tapped while the pipeline is being repaired. So that, uh, of course, Everyone knows carrying inventory is a little bit costly, but that is a small insurance premium to pay for a pipeline of this size. Attracting the consortium head or the consortium leader is a challenge. Um, we have some interesting leads, and um, we will see how that process moves forward. And again, that's the transaction advisory part of the Asian Development Bank. Financing and credit enhancement, it was very interesting to talk to the financial institutions. They basically don't care if there is orange juice going through the pipeline, as long as they get paid. So we need to figure a payment structure that can actually work and make sure that in this risky environment, should there be interruptions, that there are uh, fallback uh, mechanisms, credit enhancement, uh, that will be helps. Supply reliability is linked to the Turkmen operations. Uh, Turkmenistan has... Uh, developed a large facility on the northern part of the Golkanish field that supplies the uh, China pipelines and obviously has gained a lot of experience from that exercise and we expect that experience to be deployed at the southern part. Uh, we're looking, we are a little bit concerned about construction uh, material price volatility. We all know that steel prices move up and down rather rapidly. Uh, the interesting part now is that the feasibility study we did in 2008, actually the costing is, basically, is the same today because of the, the, the prices on steel has basically dipped down a little bit and um, so that countered the inflation factor. So we are about, I think it is about 7.5 billion for the whole project. That concludes the uh, presentation on Pakistan and TAPI. Uh, Jim and myself would be very pleased to uh, respond to inquiries and questions you may have on any of the three presentations. And once again, thank you very much to being with us this morning. Thank you. Uh, Jim, Craig, Arun, thank you very much for your uh, presentation, especially Arun and, uh, and Jim, extremely uh, informative. If I could just start by making a couple of comments myself. I'm not a technical person. I'm not, an, I'm not an economist either. I'm trained as a political scientist. Why am I excited about these projects? Because they are, I think, at the epicenter of a very major phenomenon that is taking place. Some of you might have been here in November when we did a presentation on Eurasia reconnecting. Um, and <clears throat> Eurasia was, and I talk about, when we talk about Eurasia, I'm talking about the supercontinent Eurasia, from Europe to Asia, from the Arctic to the, Indi the Indian Ocean, Halford Mackinder, big Eurasia, not a synonym for the former Soviet Union or something like that. Uh, it's reconnecting. Now, it was connected more, more than 500 years ago, before the advent of sea trade, which took precedence over the, the, uh, uh, the transcontinental uh, uh, so-called Silk Road route, or network of routes that was, that was the Silk Road. And it was a combination of sea trade and, uh, and political conflict, which, uh, which basically disconnected the, uh, the, the continent. And a thousand years ago, as our friend and colleague Fred Starr has argued, uh, really the epicenter of world trade in ways was, and this region itself. Um, the, uh, so this is, it's very, it's very big what's going on, uh, and the potential for, for this, for the role, the role for 
Central Asia, South Asia, states around it, the South Caucasus, uh, to be part of this reconnection are absolutely critical for their economic development, for their sovereignty, for their independence, uh, for their, so they have options and alternatives for trade, for investment. And if you don't have energy production and reliable energy supplies at the center, I mean, you don't really have anything. And it was uh, the Afghans themselves, going back to the, the first iteration of the Afghan National Development Strategy back in 2006, which had the vision in it for this regional economic cooperation strategy. Why? Because other, if other states are benefiting by the development of Afghan, the Afghan economy, and vice versa, then they'll have mutual buy-in. They'll have stakes in their own economic development. And maybe this can help to unwind some of the long existing political conflicts, the long existing distrust that, uh, that takes place. So um, this is, uh, from, a, from a political science standpoint, from international relations and from a security standpoint, and when you have projects or activities, real world projects, where economic and technical feasibility meet uh, and are and are facilitated by and demand and demand political cooperation. There is just a huge potential for game changing kinds of kinds of relationships. And on the you know, on the security side uh, that uh, the room mentioned. Uh, I was struck when we started um, our research on the Northern Distribution Network uh, project, and uh, when we went down to, uh, to CENTCOM and met with a combination of CENTCOM and TRANSCOM logistics people. I didn't know anything about logistics before this, uh, but was really struck. At that time, all of the uh, non-lethal material that was supporting uh, U.S. forces in Afghanistan, non-lethal materials being over 85% of what supports our forces in theater, uh, is transited by commercial carriers. And all of it was going through the port of Karachi and crossing the AFPAC border at the Torkham and Shaman Gates, virtually going through enemy territory, the heart of enemy, enemy territory. And at that time, they told me that about one half of one percent of what was being transited along that route was lost, was either bombed or stolen or whatever. There was an attrition rate of only one half of one percent, which as they informed me was actually lower <laughs> than Bayonne County, New Jersey, was the stat they used. And there may be other counties in the United States where transit is uh, not as safe as secure as the transit of our uh, materials. And that really set off a light in my head, which rarely happens. It's like, wow. So basically, you have people on the border who have become convinced that it is more in their interest to facilitate the safe transit of these materials than to prevent the safe transit of these materials, and that it was in their interest that they were secure. And if that's taking place, you know, on the AFPAC border at that time, this was six, seven years ago, you know, imagine if you have, you think of a piece of a critical infrastructure, like a pipeline, or an electric, electricity grid, generation a grid network, uh, that crosses borders and where players on both sides of the borders have it in their economic interest, their personal interest, when they're making decisions about what, what they do. Well, am I going to become, am I going to go off into the, the forest or whatever and become a radical? Or am I somehow going to benefit by what uh, these <clears throat> uh, lines of connectivity that provide power, which provides economic development and opportunities for my family, for my friends? you know, for others. And uh, that's a very, very, very powerful motivation, I think, uh, which can turn 
the security uh, issue in a different uh, in a different direction. So uh, let me stop there. Uh, there are lots of uh, people here with far more expertise uh, than I certainly have, and we want to take advantage of of Jim and Rune and Craig. So, sir, please identify yourself uh, and then uh, provide your question or comment. My name is Mahmoud Ayoub. My name is Mahmoud Ayoub. I'm uh, with Centennial Group in Washington. Uh, my question is to Rune or to Jim. On the assumption that there is successful, good progress in the negotiations of Iran on the nuclear issue with uh, uh, five plus one countries, and therefore the Iran-Pakistan gas pipeline goes forward, what would be the implications for TAPI project, especially because the Iran portion of the gas pipeline is already completed, and it's the Pakistan side that remains uh, to be completed. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much for that question, and uh, it is uh, an interesting um, aspect of the total energy picture for Pakistan. When we talk about the shortage today, the 5,000, 7,000 megawatts on a daily basis, that is all, that's the difference between the supply facilities and what is the, uh, the demand within the current power system of Pakistan. If we were to add the unserved demand in Pakistan, the one third of the population that is not on the grid today, plus the economic growth potential that is embedded in the Pakistan economy, they can take as much gas as we can possibly pump into the country. There is no competition between these two pipelines in terms of the utilization. And what it will do, the first thing it will do is to replace the very, very expensive fuel oil that Pakistan is uh, purchasing today. And having trouble purchasing at favorable rates, they're basically buying spot. And um, I would say, um, from a technical and non-political aspect, get the Iran pipeline up as soon as possible, pump in the gas, get TAPI up and running as soon as possible, utilize the gas, and you have a totally different fuel cost picture in Pakistan that will help the balance of payment and the pressure on the foreign exchange in Pakistan. It will allow for, and this is why we think energy is so sexy, because it is the lifeline of economic development. It is the the core raw material for economic development. And therefore, to unleash the potential in Pakistan, these bottlenecks must be tackled. And on the next aspect is, should Pakistan import too much, if there is such a thing? You have India on the other side, who is also uh, in, uh, in relatively, I wouldn't say they're desperate for the gas, such as Pakistan is, but they can definitely also improve their own uh, fuel balance. So uh, in terms of unleashing the economic potential in the region, uh, all of these could work together. There is no competition. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Yad al um, energy specialist and former director of operations at the World Bank. Um, my question regards the, the long-term picture. And you presented a, a tremendous picture of what's going on and projected this into the future, both Jim Liston as well as Rune yourself, um, on, the, on the gas uh, as well as the power interconnection. Um, I'm looking at Pakistan, and uh, if you look at the energy picture of Pakistan in the longer term, admittedly, as the Asian Development Bank has often said, the World Bank repeats this, uh, and, and myself I have the same view, the energy, uh, integrated energy planning capabilities of Pakistan, which were first rate at one time, have degraded, and the net result is what you see today, um, exacerbated by the problems that you both pointed out very well. But in the longer term, I think you both know that the resources in Pakistan are actually quite phenomenal. And um, there's even the possibility of shale gas, which remains unexplored, but the potential is there. Um, hydropower, 25,000 megawatts of economically available hydropower today, of which only 
16% has been utilized, and the list goes on. Coal, uh, you know, we're talking about the fifth largest find uh, of coal in the world. Um, so um, taking the longer picture, and all your projects, the ones you are mentioning, are long gestation periods. And even though there's been a resurrection after 2010, which you quite rightly point out, you still have a long way to go. In that time, I assume and I hope that Pakistan will get its act sorted out and will start developing these tremendous energy resources uh, which it has there. So my question is, in the longer term, and I'm talking about 10, 15, 20 years from now, uh, would your projects, the three major ones, plus the interconnect power interconnections, uh, would they be reversible if the flows are required the other way? I agree. There's India there, too, which is another uh, major uh, uh, consumer. Um, but again, India is developing its resources, too. So are these two-way streets? Can, we, can the power as well as the gas be uh, transported back and forth as the supply and demand changes? Or are we stuck into a one modal pattern? Because the, the latter would be, uh, I think, not very good planning. But do let me know. Thanks. OK, thank you very much for that. And I'll take the first part of it. And, and Jim can uh, supplement in terms of the, the northern part of your question. It, when it comes to Pakistan in the long term, there is no doubt that hydro is the anchor of uh, electricity supply. Uh, you are very familiar with Kalabarg. Uh, what is it now? 35 years of debate and discussion. It is the prime project for Pakistan from a technical perspective. Um, Pakistan needs multi purpose uh, hydro facilities that will cater to. Number one, uh, flood protection. Number two, water storage. The water crisis in Pakistan is as big, if not bigger, than the power crisis. And you need electricity. Uh, some of the larger facilities, when we talk about Kalabar, we talk about Daimar Basha, we talk about uh, some of the further north projects, and not only the pure hydro ones, like uh, Bunji, for example, the, the dream of every hydropower man in the world. So Pakistan's future is tremendously, tremendously uh, positive. The problem is decision making and implementation. The problem is, and if you go back to Tarbella and Mangla, uh, one constructed in each decade, and when Tarbella was built, there was a clear understanding in the Planning Commission of Pakistan, they need a Tarbella every decade, and nothing has happened, and no, Pakistan is in a deficit mode and is trying, is trying to play catch up. And there is all kinds of uh, credible solutions, but they are long term, uh, medium term at best. We are trying to also help on the short term. But looking at the future, hydro must be the anchor. Shale gas, yes, there is potential. Coal is going to be much more expensive than people think. Tar coal is very difficult. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a challenge. It is not very easy. Uh, now, should Pakistan in the next generation get into, at the end of that generation, get into a surplus situation, then is there a, what are the options? Uh, I would argue that instead of trying to reverse it back into Central Asia, I would definitely look at the eastern part of China uh, and look at some transmission facilities going that way. Uh, in terms of moving, and I'm talking again away from politics, we are technocrats and we don't uh, operate very much in the political stratosphere. But assuming that there is a normalization of relationship between India and Pakistan, I mean, the, the demands in Punjab, for example, on both sides of the border, there is tremendous opportunities for um, even looking at uh, peak load curves and flattening out the peak load curves with supplies from either side of the border. So there are, there are other uh, avenues to go as well, uh, in not only looking at reversing, but it should be possible to reverse. Right, Jim? You're the engineer. OK, yeah, I think we still are going, yeah. <clears throat> so to answer your question, yes, all the um, electrical facilities are bi-directional. So that's your question number one. Number two. There is an immediate bi-directional opportunity. Whereas we mentioned that Kyrgyz and Tajik uh, have summer surplus and uh, big exporters in summer. In fact, they're in, a, in winter, it's quite a different situation. They're in deficit. 
And as recently as 2009, there was a humanitarian crisis in Tajikistan when the people were dying because of no electricity, no energy. Um, so with the grid that we presented, <coughs> um, in fact, Turkmenistan by 2018 would be able to supply the winter deficit in Tajikistan through Afghanistan. That's just an example of the of the flexibility. <coughs> and Afghanistan will be a, a net energy importer and net power importer for the foreseeable future, 10, 20 years. But should it get uh, projects moving, it's got hydro potential, and then it has got the opportunity to, to export uh, winter to Kyrgyz and Tajik, and of course summer to, to uh, Pakistan. So there's, it's flexible design. Thank you. Hi, I am Don Ritter. I'm president of the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce. I've been involved in Afghanistan since the Soviets invaded. That may be my fault. But, uh, um, I, I, I want to just, I think this was a great presentation, by the way. Um, anyway, the governments change and the politics change and many of the people who you work with change. ADB is that constant and the integrity of ADB, uh, the respect and the credibility as you mentioned is so important. Um, but have you, has ADB made any attempt to engage the respective user communities in these different uh, countries by virtue of their major national chambers of commerce, business associations, because this could be a uh, stabilizing force in terms of the uh, different countries and the impact on changing political uh, uh, elites. Have, have, has ADB uh, made that attempt? Uh, in terms of Pakistan, we have uh, had an ongoing dialogue with the Chamber of Commerce and, and both the, the Federal Chamber of Commerce and also the Industrial Chamber of Commerce that is around. The, we are focusing on energy efficiency and because the, in the Industrial Chamber of Commerce there is, there is a lot of the manufacturing companies. The problem is uh, that the industrialists today have not understood that they don't need to add another manufacturing production line to make money. They can actually take out the single speed engine that is in the manufacturing today, replace it by multi-speed motors, and the payback period is about somewhere between eight and 12 months. And after that, everything is gravy. So the issue should be on the focus on the cash rather than they want to increase their sales volume. And that has been a big hurdle to, to go through that there's, there's a mental a certain attitude change related to energy efficiency, and that is true in all societies, not only in Pakistan and Afghanistan or the rest of the, 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 the 10 countries we operate in. It's also true in Europe, it's true here, that an industrialist would like to produce more. They, they don't look at the uh, efficiency gains that they can have. That's number one. Number two, and let's uh, talk, uh, do some straight talking here as well. For a lot of the, the uh, industries, they don't pay very much for electricity in these countries. And therefore, it is a fixed cost for them. There is nothing to gain. The, the meter man comes down and he needs his little envelope and he gets his envelope and he walks away and everyone is happy. Um, what is not happy is the system itself because the system doesn't get the money it requires to for maintenance, for augmentation, expansions, and all of that. So there's an economic problem, but at the unit financial level, this is a fixed cost. And if there is a fixed cost, then there's no financial incentive for the industrialist to change. And again, here we come back to the third pillar that we put up on the Pakistan presentation, which goes on the governance aspect of the sector, which is linked to metering, billing, and proper tariff mechanisms that are being set in the country. So uh, yes, we are working, to answer your question directly, we are working with these associations, but we don't see the enthusiasm to tackle the problems 
uh, because the, the, they, they are liking the subsidies, and the subsidies make them more money. And the ones that are supplying the Fortune 500 companies are totally self-sufficient already. They have their own water systems, they have their own power systems. You can actually go inside their compounds, lift it up and place it in any country in the world and they will still be uh, extremely high quality producers of the goods they do. And, and they are independent. So they are not, most of them are not even on the grid anymore because they cannot rely on it. Because there's two things with grid power for the industrialist. One is that the supply but not only the supply on the hours of the day, it's also the quality. For those of you that know Pakistan, uh, the textile industry is very big. And the good old textile mechanical machinery could see the 50 hertz drop to 47 hertz and still clunker and work. Today, there is, the, the new machinery is run by chip technology. And as soon as you drop down to 49.5 hertz, they conk out. And that means that you have stop in production, you have to restart, and these restarts are expensive, are very expensive. So the quality of supply is probably as important as the number of hours you have supply. So you have two problems for the industrialist. And he, the ones that can afford it, they go off the grid and they have captive arrangements, and then we lose them. So then the debate is not really with them. Uh, but there are also uh, or, uh, in, um, business associations in Pakistan that has put together, together plans for the government to adopt on the power side, and we have been working with them on the development of their plans as well. So good interaction in, uh, in Pakistan. Jim? Yeah, uh, maybe the situation in Afghanistan is a little bit different from Pakistan. First of all, we, there isn't an industrial base. The demand is domestic. And the hunger for, for power is palpable. Um, you know, when I visit the utility dabs, there's a line of people out there wanting to get connections. People want supply. And they will pay. The tariff, I mean, maybe it's not quite cost reflective, but it's 10 cents per kilowatt hour. In terms of that region, I mean, it's, it's among the highest. <coughs> and people are really want electricity. So of course ADB, we have our, our regulations when we're um, uh, financing any construction, we are obliged to consult with civil society organizations and ensuring safeguards and uh, 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 compensation to affected persons, etc. And you know, the, the huge demand is make the project, get it in there. You know, this is their, this is the focus, this is the message we're getting back from the population. And it, it, it translates into Taliban do not blow up the assets. The transmission lines, if you look at that line there, they have been built. It's a simple matter to, to blow this up, but they don't do it because even Taliban needs some kind of support. And, um, you know, it, it, this is so much wanted by, by, by the, by, by, by the, the population. The master plan was presented at a public forum. I'd say there was 500 people, par parliamentarians, civil society organization, donors, everybody. And you know, the message, make it happen, build it, get it done. How soon can you do it? How soon can you, can, can you get connection? So, you know, I mean, it's, 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 it's a fantastic opportunity to be working to try to meet that, that demand that people want and they will pay. Thank you. Well, I'll leave Rune to talk about that. Uh, well, the easy answer is that that's a different region. But uh, the, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, <laughs> different delineations. Um, no, India, we are very active. I uh, have a very, very large energy program. In my earlier years, I worked in both uh, Madhya Pradesh and, um, and Gujarat province. Uh, India is very large, uh, as we all know. Uh, the World Bank uh, and ADB did a division of labor. We took some states, they took some state, uh, states. And uh, the issue is the same. You work with the Federation uh, in terms of the, the uh, uh, industrial uh, as well as the, uh, the business communities. And uh, the hard part is to convince them to pay the tariff. 
I mean, let's talk about the, 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 the basics. The, you have a service delivery. If you want it to be permanent 24-7, 365 days, you've got to pay the cost of supply. Um, Gujarat province is a fascinating place. Um, the politicians were very smart and say agriculture, zero tariff. Um, number two, in 1986, the government said, well, let's knock down all the meters for the agriculture because we don't need to know how much they use. Um, very nice. So when we came in, they, um, the state government found themselves faced with a $1 billion a year deficit in the power sector, which took away the whole budget. It meant that the politician couldn't do anything. They were absolutely handcuffed and say, we cannot do this anymore. We need money for our social projects. Um, and we said, fine. The first thing we wanted to do is to, to look at the declassification of customers. Sounds very simple, right? So then you start looking and it's like, oops, suddenly 54% of the number of customers are classified as agriculture. I like IAB very much. And since he's my buddy, I classify him as agriculture. He has an industrial concern in his backyard, but he has three rows of potatoes in his front yard. <laughs> he's agriculture, right? So when you do that, when you start to look at the fundamentals and trying then to work with these people who sits in the federations, it's a bit of a challenge because there's a direct impact, short-term impact on their wallet, but not long-term. So those that understand it, and in Gujarat, we were very lucky, the Industrial Chamber of Commerce was a major part in the change to, number one, get the regulator established, get the regulator independent, and what is saving Gujarat is that the farmers, they were not pumping water out of the, uh, the ground anymore. They were mining water because it was free of charge, right? All the pumps were running free of charge. And what happens when you go far down enough under the water table? What do you find? Salt. So you take the salt water up, put it out on the, on the uh, produce that you're trying. What happens to the, your, uh, your harvest? It dies. So suddenly the big farmers realize that we are actually killing our own crops. So we need to stop this. This doesn't work. So in a perverse kind of way, the market mechanism worked, but it was a cost that was way too costly for the provincial government. But there are challenges working with the chambers because the immediate business interest is that subsidies are good, free electricity is even better, and we make more money. So, but it, the point is, yes, we need to work with them and we need to convince them. So you work on the technical side, you, you work on the governance side, and you work on the customer and client relationship and understanding. Very important. Thank you. Okay. Uh, if oh, I could sorry. add one note on that, uh, some corporate speak. Uh, last year, 18% of ADB's operations were private sector related. Under our strategy 2020, that's supposed to move up to 50% by 2020. Uh, both in terms of value as well as the number of investments. And uh, as a matter of course, for any private sector operation, we engage with chambers of commerce, business associations, business people, banking associations, uh, what have you. So yes, there's active collaboration. And thank you for your support for ADB over the years, both as a member of Congress and for me uh, in Afghanistan through the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce. Okay, we're entering the, uh, the last quarter, so to speak. We have about 15 minutes left. Lots of questions. I'm going to move to the back of the room. We're going to collect a couple of uh, questions, comments at a time, okay? The gentleman holding the white piece of paper has been waiting patiently for a long time. <coughs> My name is Farooq Subhan. I'm the president of the Bangladesh Enterprise Institute and the current chair of the South Asian Regional Initiative on Energy Cooperation in South Asia funded by USAID. And I can assure you that uh, a lot of our time and attention has been focused on TAPI and the future of TAPI. Uh, I have uh, three questions on, on TAPI. One is, uh, is there now an agreement uh, on the pricing of the gas, uh, both at the start of the pipeline, meaning how much do the Turkmenistan government want and what will be the price of the gas when it reaches India? 
Number two, have you addressed the, uh, and this was raised by uh, Andrew, uh, the security aspects of the pipeline. Is that a part of uh, ADB's portfolio, or are you leaving this uh, to the, the governments? And finally, uh, the financing of the pipeline. I, I think you ended off by saying, if I heard you correctly, uh, roughly $8 billion. Uh, where is this financing coming from, and how much progress have you made uh, on the financing of the pipeline? And my final footnote is uh, Bangladesh has formally applied to become a member of TAPI, and my understanding was that we are now on board. Is that correct? Okay, now just for clarification, that was one question. That was one three-part question, <laughs> because each person is only allowed one question, okay? Uh, and no footnotes. Okay, gentlemen over here in the back of the room, sorry. Uh, yes. Craig Karp, I'm a consultant for the UN Economic Commission for Europe. Um, I want to remark that the Kyrgyz and the Tajiks are very, very eager for the CASA project. And uh, I know there is a tariff gap there. Um, has the ADB been looking at um, non-traditional ways to close the tariff gap, including possibly climate change funding. Uh, the, uh, the panel, uh, pricing of gas, security of pipeline, financing, and is Bangladesh part of TAPI, TAPIB? Uh, uh, and of course, the, the last question about uh, the question of tariff pricing for CASA. And thank you, Andrew. I'll take the questions uh, from Mr. Farouk on, uh, on the TAPI. There is an agreement on pricing between Turkmenistan and the three buyers. Uh, the price negotiations, we drafted the documents, and then we were thrown out of the room, uh, and they said we will discuss prices among ourselves. Uh, and we thought that was absolutely fantastic. We have no reason to be in the room when the countries are making progress, and we have done our job by facilitating them coming together, drafting documents, and their own commercial sense uh, for pluses and minuses. We were very pleased to stay away from uh, those detailed negotiations. What's important for us was that agreement was reached and signed. Uh, and I cannot sh share with you the prices because I actually don't know them. Uh, we haven't, they, they are not public. Uh, the security of the um, segments inside each sovereign country is the responsibility of the country itself. Uh, as I said, ADB has uh, done several uh, security studies, both in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, I mentioned Pakistan using the storage facilities of depleted fields. Uh, the volumes have been uh, discussed and looked at uh, in terms of what's available and how much it would cost to prepare the fields for storage and also in uh, Afghanistan in terms of uh, the approach to the, uh, the security. The government has said that they will use their paramilitary troops to uh, secure it, and it's also expected that there will be some local arrangements that Andrew mentioned in the, in the first place to involve the local communities. The financing, um, this will probably come across as being a little bit cocky, but it is based on the, the dialogue we have with the financing community, and that is that money is not the trouble. Money is not the problem. There will be money for this. There will be two things that will, this will be based on. One, it will be the credit enhancement uh, facilities that are linked to the, um, to the financing, uh, and also the excitement of being party to such a project by the financial institutions have been quite surprising to us when we, when we did the roadshow, as well as individual discussions we have had with the large financial institutions afterwards. So there is a clear appetite in the financing market to participate, but some of the fundamentals that we are working on now will be the platform that they are looking at before they come in with the direct financing. Um, on the Bangladesh issue, uh, Bangladesh sent an application to the Asian Development Bank to be part of TAPI. 
we uh, requested the government of Bangladesh to uh, approach the seller, which is uh, Turkmenistan, and uh, up to date, Bangladesh is not a member of TAPI, so there is no TAPIB yet. Hi, uh, Kyrgyz and uh, Tajik are very keen to uh, expand their markets for their summer surplus. Uh, Kyrgyz today exports to Kazakhstan, uh, so it's got a single, single bar. So it is keen to have a market access to a market to the south. And Tajikistan has no market. It is spilling the water. So th th these two countries are big supporters of uh, CASA. Actually, we also believe they are big supporters of TUTAP, it being the same technical solution to enable sellers to meet buyers. Um, the commercial discussions are ongoing. ADB is not party to the, the commercial discussions. This is a World Bank-led uh, initiative. Uh, we understand that they are at an advanced stage. Uh, the the, um, the exporters will receive a tariff uh, per kilowatt hour for their exports. Added to that is a common transmission charge for which all users will pay. Then there are transit fees for Tajikistan and to be received by Tajikistan and Afghanistan. And the concept is that the landed cost of electricity in Pakistan should be less than the avoided uh, variable operational cost. And all of this indicates a commercially viable project, albeit for five months per, per year. So the actual figures are the, 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 the uh, negotiations are going on probably as we speak, are, but uh, quite imminently. So maybe watch that space and see the um, the, the conclusion which should be public maybe in the in the near future. Financing, there is a, a financing gap uh, between the approved funds uh, and the approximately $1 billion project estimate. And uh, again, this is something that uh, World Bank are negotiating with, with a number of, um, of, of financing sources. Thank you. And just to remind you, uh, tomorrow morning we will have a discussion of a uh, lengthier discussion of uh, CASA and TUTAP, and a World Bank representative will be here to, uh, to talk about that. And maybe be able to be able to shed uh, more light. Yes, we'll come up for two questions to the toward toward the front right here, and then. Uh, thank you, uh, Bill Jorn is my name. I'm serve on the board with Don Ritter of the Afghan American Chamber of Commerce. We blame them for a lot of things, by the way, but not, not the Soviet uh, actions. Um, we're very interested in market, uh, free market economies and uh, private sector development. So I'm wondering, within the scope of these plans and programs and uh, procurement pr uh, processes and so forth, what assurances can be made that uh, local companies such as in Afghanistan, construction, supplies, services, communications, and so forth, will be given a fair shot at uh, the work that will be contracted out. Hi, uh, David Sedney, a uh, former with the, with the uh, State Department, Defense Department. Uh, it was interesting the comment you made about uh, financing, uh, and uh, but at the same time you laid out a pretty bleak picture for uh, cost recovery or income from Pakistan uh, in the energy sector. I'm wondering how you square that. Uh, how are why are people going to be willing to finance this uh, if the likelihood of getting real revenue from Pakistan uh, is as bleak as at least I took your uh, question to be? Thank you. I'll, I'll take the, the last question and Jim will come back on the procurement in, uh, in Afghanistan. Um, very interesting. Um, let's see if we can do some uh, economics 101. Uh, right now, go back to the, the, to the bullet point where it says 35% 30, of fuel supply or the fuel mix today in Pakistan is fuel oil. It's exceptionally expensive. 
Therefore, that it, it, is, it costs them 75% of total, the total bill for electricity or the, or the fuel cost. The, the picture, we need to change it. And when we change that picture, then the difference between the determined tariff and the notified tariff with the government will go. The, the determined tariff will come down because the fuel source will be cheaper using gas rather than fuel oil. So the requirement for subsidy will be minimized. The subsidy is never paid in Pakistan. So the thing here is to come down and try to get rid of the, even the concept of a notified tariff by the government, get rid of it and go by the determined tariff by the regulator. That will only happen in the political space when these figures are as close to each other or hopefully identical or the determined tariff, the new determined tariff is below the old notified tariff. So when you get the cheaper gas, cheaper, the, the, not the cheaper gas, the gas that is cheaper than fuel oil, when you get that fuel mix change then you will get the impact on the tariff and you get down to a non-subsidized point and therefore you have full cost recovery. So that is, that is how we square it. And it's very interesting to run some of the, the, the small models that we have put together to make sure. And the thing with electricity, it is unit cost based. And suddenly when you talk about 100,000 gigawatt hours, then a unit cost squaring then have massive impact on the subsidy requirements on the national budget. So th this has not, as I said in the beginning, the question you raised is not an energy question, uh, sector question, it's actually a, a fiscal space question for the government and therefore it's so important to get the fuel mix right in, in Pakistan. The second, just to add to that, since this is a, a crucial um, pillar for us, the pillar number one was tariff is then to also say coal-fired power is so much cheaper than the imported fuel oil. So you get gas into the equation and hopefully a properly priced gas, and then let's not open that can of worms, but just leave it there. And then we look at the coal-fired, which is the cheapest possible uh, source right now. And then you have a situation in Pakistan where actually the tariff, that is the, the determined tariff today can be, uh, can drop down to a level where the notified tariff square and then there's no need for subsidies anymore. Thank you. I can be quick on the um, Afghan uh, local business opportunities. Um, there is weak capacity in Afghanistan. Um, of course, bidders, these are open international competitive uh, bidding projects and international companies try to minimize their exposure to security risks in Afghanistan by maximizing their, their, their local uh, component. And this is what is happening. Um, over our projects in the power sector, we find that there is an increasing component of local companies as they build up their, their capacity. But we do not specify a minimum local component. Uh, at this stage, the market is evolving and right now we're trying to get competitive bids. Uh, it is improving. Um, in some years ago, it was difficult to get bids at all. So putting restrictions on bidders was going to jeopardize an already difficult situation. But as I said, the situation is improving. There is a growing uh, local uh, capacity, but it's weak and growing. Thank you. Okay, sports fans and music lovers, we're in the two-minute warning now, and we're not going to go into sudden death. I care too much about these guys, and it's the love. <laughs> and as they said, it's the love bank. Um, David, you weren't here at the beginning, so you missed that. Uh, next, yes, right here, and then the gentleman next to him, and then right here, and then we're going to have to yeah, take those uh, three. Sorry. Ken, Ken Meyer, Gord World Docs. Uh, according to the bank maintaining its integrity, I assume the bank uh, is beholden, as we all are to a certain extent, to the people who provide our funds. Uh, what are those entities and have they uh, made it difficult for the bank to maintain their integrity in the past? Uh, for instance, Afghanistan has uh, promised to secure the pipeline in its territory, but our government seems to insist that American troops be in place to provide that protection. 
I, I don't except, know. except by the time the pipeline is built, there will be no American troops. So, yes. Uh, Jerry Brown, uh, Institute for Economic Stability. Great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, wondering if the folks from the bank have looked at the, uh, if you look at the 30% of uh, people who have electricity in Afghanistan, um, if you look at uh, offsetting the economies of scale from generation, from big projects, uh, versus getting that electricity to the last mile uh, in some of the places you're going to run through, Farah, Helmand, et cetera. Um, have, you, have you compared that in terms of total cost of and cost recovery for distributed models versus kind of traditional, you know, big generation, big transmission, um, distribution that doesn't work? Uh, Rajendra Kumar, I'm small business, and it's an excellent pre presentation. And this, if completed, would be a boon to all the small industries in India which currently rely on diesel gas for power generation. The question I had was, what happens if, for some reason, the gas is not delivered at the end point? Is there a penalty, or how does that work? Okay, I, I'll just hit on the um, Afghan questions. Uh, the integrity, uh, let's say, you're talking about the integrity of the assets that are built rather than the integrity of the business procurement process. Will the assets remain standing? I, as I mentioned, uh, contrary to all concerns and risks, in fact, the assets are not attacked because they are, they are wanted so much uh, that even, even Taliban do not attack. So in terms of the, the assets, they, they have not been, there have been, experience has been very good. <coughs> Regarding off-grid, um, we, uh, we are not looking at a, um, a, a, a grid supply uh, to the 86% of the population by 2032. This is not viable. Um, we are looking at a $1 billion series of investments over the next decade. And uh, that includes imports and um, some generation, but a sizable component, maybe 20% of that, is for off-grid uh, supply to communities that will not, uh, are not expected to uh, receive grid supply in the medium future, and these communities cannot <coughs> be con condemned to darkness. So in consultation, as all our projects are with the government, um, we are allocating maybe 200 million to uh, off-grid supply, which would be solar, wind, uh, hybrid, um, uh, local local um, units. Thank you. Uh, answering the last question, in terms of uh, penalties for non-supply of gas, if you're talking about the TAPI pipeline, um, uh, there are commercial terms being drawn up. Uh, the um, concern that we have had has been much more on force majeure events rather than a commercial non-supply. Uh, if you look at the supply uh, in the uh, pipelines that Turkmenistan has today, they are um, quite good. So that history and that experience is not the major concern. The concern has been on force majeure events, which means that the storage in Pakistan is very important that there is an inventory of gas available, so we don't have, so the ISGS or uh, Sui Northern in Pakistan or Gale in India have access to gas, that, uh, so it makes it uninterruptible for the end customer, very important for us. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, we must conclude this game. The good news is that we have another game tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, same time, same place, same bat channel. We will be discussing in greater depth 2TAP and CASO 1000. Uh, if you've not RSVP to that event, you can do so at rep at csis.org. Speaking of the website, if you somehow didn't quite capture every piece of information that was conveyed today, the presentations by Rune, uh, and by Jim will be up on the CSIS website uh, shortly. Uh, and of course, for further information about anything virtually having to do with energy and economic development and love in Central Asia <laughs> and uh, South Asia, Asia at large, consult the, uh, uh, the, the ADB 
uh, website, particularly uh, the Carrick, the Carrick site, is chock full of all kinds of useful uh, information. So uh, with that, let me uh, uh, thank very much Rune and Jim for their fabulous presentations and thank Craig uh, for co-sponsoring the event and uh, hope to see some of you tomorrow morning. Thank you.